Good afternoon, everyone. It's Thursday, June 4, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. I am Sheila Siar, and I will be your moderator. Our topic for this week is uh, promoting sustainable economies and better public health, two equally important and urgent issues that should be part of our development agenda as we look towards recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and as we refocus our ed energies to uh, meet the sustainable development goals. And we are fortunate to have collaborated once more with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCOP, and this knowledge sharing event. And to formally open our event and uh, share, share insights about the topic, here is the president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mamsel? Hello, Mamsel. Mamsel. We seem to have uh, lost uh, Mamsel. She's still in the call, right? Yes. Okay, so, um, well, while we are waiting for, um, for uh, Dr. Reyes, uh, I'd like to give you a summary of our uh, program this afternoon. So uh, we will have the opening remarks of our president, Dr. Reyes, and shortly after that, we will have the, the two presentations, one from UNSCOP and the other from uh, PIDS. And shortly after the presentations, uh, we will hear the comments of uh, our two discussants, and then we will proceed right away to the open forum. We, we would like to encourage everyone to uh, participate in the discussion, and here is how we usually uh, conduct the Q&A. So while the presentation or the open forum is ongoing, if you have any um, question or uh, comment, uh, please use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of your screen. And as I don't know all of you, could you please type your name and your affiliation and your question, and I will call you during the open forum. And then for our few uh, viewers on Facebook, um, we encourage you to uh, join our discussions as, as well. So just type your question in the comment section and I will read your um, comments or your question during the open forum. And as also as part of our house rules, we would like to uh, request everyone to please check your, always check your microphones and make sure it is muted. And this is to prevent any background noise that may uh, distract our speakers and your fellow participants. I think our president, Dr. Reyes, is ready. So, uh, friends, um, to formally open our event and share her, her insights about the topic of our webinar, which is promoting sustainable economies and better public health, here is the president of the PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome our guests, including those from Thailand, colleagues from the government, representatives from the academe, civil society, media, and the private sector to this afternoon's webinar. Um, in particular, uh, I think we're expecting uh, some of our friends, uh, including our PIDS board member, uh, attorney uh, Rafael Lotelia, to join us, uh, including um, MUSEC uh, Laura Pasqua from DBM, and of course our our regular partners from CPBRD, led by Director General Romulo Miral, um, as well as friends from NEDA. Um, I think they are a director uh, from Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Environment staff. Uh, director Nieva Natural has joined the, the group as well. And also Dr. Alvin Colaba, um, who has crafted, helped craft our research agenda for the next five years um, from the LSU is also part of the group this afternoon. 
Um, this afternoon's webinar, as Sheila mentioned, is part of our annual collaboration with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCAP. We'd like to thank them for their continued trust and support to PIDS. Through the advent of technologies, we're able to share information and interact with one another virtually no matter where we are in the world. So we are glad to have all of you in this online seminar. In fact, some of our speakers are, well, actually, none of our speakers are actually here at PIDS. Um, one is in Bangkok, um, I think one is in Laguna, Makati, and I think Dr. Ho is in Manila, probably. So the, the, right now what we're seeing is that the world is reeling from the effects of the COVID pandemic. The Philippines is no exception. We've seen the economy contracted during the first quarter of this year, the first time since the fourth quarter of 1998. While restrictions have eased starting this month, businesses and public transportation are still very limited. Given the importance of the issue, that highlight the interplay of economic, social, and environmental concerns. And they also have important implications on how we respond to the COVID pandemic. First is the UNSCAP's Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2020, which focuses on goal 12 of the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. And also, um, and environmental well-being and identifies how post-COVID recovery can be aligned towards sustainable economies. The survey has identified underlying factors that have been slowing down the progress of achieving SDG 12, particularly the challenges that hinder different stakeholders from government, businesses, and general public in shifting towards an environmentally sustainable development path. Adjustment to these changes should be supported by enabling policies to be issued by government. Today, our expert from Bank uh, from uh, SCAP will present the situation and offer some recommendations for Asia and the Pacific, and the Philippines in particular. Details of the report will be discussed by Dr. Shivojit Banerjee, Economics Affairs Officer at UNSCAP, while comments will be provided by Dr. Marites Chonko, Dean and full professor at the De La Salle University School of Economics. Um, one of the most affected sectors by this pandemic is the health sector. The ability to respond well to the pandemic depends on the capacity of our health system. The second presentation is about fiscal decentralization and health service delivery to be discussed by PIDS supervising research specialist Janet Cuenca, who just finished her, her PhD. In the Philippines, health service delivery has been devolved to local government units. Based on the study, greater health decentralization has resulted in the decline of inpatient services in public hospitals. This is due to the inadequate budget of local government units in maintaining and upgrading devolved health facilities. As we all know, um, health services in the Philippines are devolved under the local government code of 1991. Such authority gives them greater responsibility to provide health services to people in the grassroots as well as operate and maintain health facilities such as district hospitals and rural health units. Health devolution was supposed to increase LGU spending on healthcare delivery services to achieve better health outcomes. However, this has not been the case with local governments. 
you will know more about these issues as well as policy recommendations that will address them from our speaker later on this afternoon. We'll also be hearing the insights of Dr. Beverly Ho, Director uh, for Health Promotion and Communication Service at the Department of Health um, about this particular issue. So this afternoon, we have two equally relevant studies. So I'm looking forward to your active participation during the open forum. Once again, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Thank you very much, Mamsel. Again, um, I'd like to um, remind everyone to please check your microphones and make sure that this is muted. Thank you. Okay, so the first study that we will hear is the Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2020, and it will be presented by Dr. Shobhajit Banerjee. Dr. Banerjee is uh, an economic affairs officer it, in the Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division of ESCAP. He previously worked as a program manager on foreign direct investments at UCTAD in Switzerland, as a policy advisor on economic reform issues at the UNDP in Indonesia, and as an investment banker at Morgan Stanley in, in London. He obtained his PhD and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science and his MPhil in Economics from the University of Cambridge. So here now is uh, Dr. Banerjee. Over to you now, sir, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? All right. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this invitation um, to the Philippines Policy Dialogue on promoting sustainable economies and better public health, hosted kindly by the Philippines Institute of Development Studies. On behalf of ESCAP, as you mentioned, I will be presenting the findings of the 2020 edition of the ESCAP flagship publication, Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, which is titled Towards Sustainable Economies. The general focus of the presentation, building on the findings of the report and our analysis of the recent global pandemic is how post-COVID-19 recovery can be directed towards achieving sustainable economies. Our key messages are that Asia and the Pacific is not on track to achieve any of the SDGs, in particular, sustainable consumption and production, and environmental well-being. And this implies that the economic growth-centric development approach of our region should be revisited. Clearly, the current economic slowdown is exacerbated by the COVID-19. So the region was already going through a slowdown, and that has been you know, made much worse by the COVID-19. However, when we now look to policy responses, we should remember that we should prioritize people over economic recovery, and the journey towards the 2030 agenda should continue. The pandemic and the climate emergency should also be a wake-up call to policymakers that we have to move away from short-termism towards a long-term vision of development. And this can only be done through collective policy actions by governments and supported by businesses and people, along with enhanced global and regional cooperation. Particularly, if we look at the Philippines case, the country's economy has been hit hard by the pandemic, but the government has responded actively with a comprehensive fiscal package to meet the short-term impacts of the pandemic. But our message is that going forward, greater spending will be required to ensure future health preparedness and improve social protection, as well as continuing the journey to decarbonize the economy. So let us look at why and how, I mean, the growth, GDP growth-centric development approach of the region has come at a cost to people and the planet. Over the past two decades, the region has maintained high growth rates. 
which has contributed to income growth and job creation. This has lifted 1 billion people out of extreme poverty, if we measure poverty at the $1.9 per day poverty line. However, let's consider poverty reduction in a more uh, comprehensive manner. In the past two decades, reduction in extreme poverty has taken place at almost the same rate as income growth. However, those lifted out of extreme poverty are still vulnerable. And if we raise our ambitions on poverty reduction from the $1.9 a day level to the $3.2 a day level or the $5.5 a day level, the number of people pulled above the higher poverty lines appear marginal and the reduction is almost stagnant in recent years. Additionally, the region faces high levels of inequality. As the figure shows, the top 10% of income groups takes away half of the income, while the bottom 50% of the income group only takes away about 10% of the income. Furthermore, even more worrisome is that the growth-centric development approach has come at a cost to our planet. The region's GDP growth is largely dependent on resource use. Surging resource use has contributed to massive increases in CO2 emissions, which has heightened the region's climate risk. Some similar trends are also observed in the Philippines. Economic growth has contributed to economic growth job creation, and reduction in extreme poverty. If we raise our ambitions beyond the $1.9 a day extreme poverty line, reduction in poverty is at a much slower pace, at the $3.2 level and the $5.5 level. In the Philippines in particular, the number of people living under the $5.5 a day level actually increased in the past two decades. Furthermore, Resource use has been at the heart of the country's economic growth, which has fed into its CO2 emissions. Our analysis at ESCAP shows that the region is off track to achieve the 2030 agenda. It is regress indeed. The, 20, the line in the middle indicates where the region should have got to in each of the sustainable development goals by 2019, if they are to be on track to meet the 2030 goal. As you can see, none of the SDGs progress has been uh, to the required uh, level. However, the most worrisome fact is that there's even been regression in some of the SDGs. And the most uh, biggest example of that is in re responsible consumption and production, uh, SDG 12, the red line, the biggest red line um, on, as you see. And uh, the other one being climate action, SDG 13, the other red line. So that is why our analysis in the economic and social survey this year concentrates on the issue of sustainable consumption and production, which is uh, SDG 12. As you may not be fully aware of what SDG 12 entails, I'd like to provide a bit more background. SDG goal 12 is titled Ensuring Sustainable Consumption and Production Patterns. It includes eight main targets and several sub-targets which focus on sustainable resource management, sustainable business practice and reporting, sustainable tourism, sustainable public procurement practices, sustainable market mechanisms, sustainable living, sustainable finance, and so on. Indeed, other than meeting uh, goal 12 being important by its, on its own, it is also an effective way to accelerate progress on achieving the rest of the 2030 agenda. This is because of the synergies between Goal 12 and many of the other sustainable development goals, such as no hunger, water and consumption, education, etc. So how do we progress on Goal 12? That will call for revisiting the current consumption and production patterns of our region. And this will require behavioral change by the key different stakeholders, these being governments, businesses, and consumers. 
the current problems for each of the sectors are for governments, that there is a, a undue dependency on fossil fuels and underpricing of carbon. For businesses, there's a failure to account for the externalities of their business practices. And for consumers, it's ingrained consumption habits and lack of environmental awareness. Clearly, the challenging near-term economic outlook poses significant obstacles to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and to sustainable consumption production in particular. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly affected the economic performance globally and regionally. Countries have introduced measures to contain COVID-19, such as travel restrictions, suspension of production, and lockdown of cities. These measures have affected people and companies, which have introduced shocks from both the supply and the demand sides. Such shocks have spilled across borders. For instance, manufacturers are affected through supply chains and lower demand for commodities has affected commodity exporters. Thus, COVID-19 has significantly weighed on the region's economic performance. The region's total GDP growth is expected to decrease by more than four percentage points as compared to our previous estimate for 2020. The Philippines, the Philippines' GDP growth in 2020 is expected to be lowered by five percentage points compared with our pre-COVID forecast of 5.6%. The domestic economy has been hit hard by the lockdown which has been longer and stricter than some other neighboring countries. Sadly, the number of cases still remains high, although the number of deaths has declined, but there is still quite a road ahead. The pandemic has affected the economy through a number of main channels, which has had a knock-on impact through the consumption, which accounts for 72% of GDP. Remittance inflows, which account for about 8% of GDP, may contract by 2 to 3% reflecting the impact of the health crisis in overseas locations, as well as the oil price impact on the Middle East, which accounts for about 20% of the total in 2019. Tourism receipts, which account for 2.5% of GDP, are another main channel of impact. Loss of both of these sources of revenue will also have an impact on the country's external position. The current account deficit is expected to widen, though the impact will be cushioned by lower oil prices. Nevertheless, the country's external situation remains sound, with high foreign currency reserves and low gross external debt. In the face of the pandemic, what policy responses have regional countries introduced and what else can be done? Large and targeted fiscal measures to contain and respond to COVID-19 and to ease the shock to jobs and guarantee minimum living standards have been undertaken. Most countries in the region, at least 49 of them, have announced fiscal packages as of the end of April. The size of fiscal stimulus packages differs across countries, ranging from 0.1% to over 20% of GDP, with a median of about 2.8%. At the sub-regional level, countries in East and Northeast Asia are increasing public spending at a relatively larger scale on average followed by countries in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. But the situation is evolving quickly as countries are introducing new stimulus measures. The Philippines has announced a comprehensive fiscal package of 595.6 billion pesos, or about 3.1% of GDP, to support vulnerable individuals and groups. This includes support to low-income households, to vulnerable workers, for medical response and for small businesses. Furthermore, on June the 2nd, the House of Representatives approved a 1.3 billion peso economic stimulus package that aims to help industries affected by the coronavirus. <coughs> About half is planned for wage subsidies and loans for businesses hit by the lockdown. The remaining half of the proposed package will be used to build facilities for health, education, and food security. However, the package still has some steps to go in the legislative process before it comes to implementation. 
In addition to the spending to cope with the short-term challenges imposed by COVID-19, it's also Dr. Banerjee, yes. excuse me, yes. uh, if you can just close, please, the small window. Oh, yes. Because okay. it is uh, blocking the PowerPoint. Ah, okay. Yes, yes please. Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Yes, Thank sir. you. Um, okay. In addition to the spending to cope with the short-term challenges imposed by COVID-19, it's also important for countries to enhance resilience to deal with such crises in the future. This is key when undertaking medium-term packages focused on recovery. In this regard, it is essential to build ex-ante emergency preparedness to save lives and minimize economic impacts. Our estimates show that the Asia-Pacific region needs to invest an additional $880 million per year through 2030 in emergency preparedness. Countries should also increase investment in social protection because social protection can act as an automatic stabilizer when crises hit. The figure on the left shows that public spending on social protection in Asia Pacific countries is relatively low compared with the global average, which is a green line in the figure. Our estimates show that the region needs to invest an annual additional $158 billion by 2030 to provide universal health coverage. The Philippines is public spending on social protection is also low. Last year, our team estimated that providing a social protection floor in the Philippines would require an annual additional investment of 1.3% of GDP. This should be well within the fiscal, fiscal or financial means of the country. Currently, Many countries are also planning to reopen their, their economies and are designing the economic recovery packages. It's important that these recovery policies should be linked to investment needs and priorities for achieving other SDGs, such as increasing investment in ICT and water and sanitation infrastructure. Last year, our team estimated that the Philippines needs to invest an annual additional amount of roughly 1% of GDP to close the infrastructure gap in ICT and the water and sanitation sectors. Increased public spending is clearly expected to deteriorate near-term fiscal positions in the region more than in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis. Although the precise magnitude is uncertain and will vary across countries, the average fiscal deficit in the Asia-Pacific region is projected to widen from 2.2% of GDP in 2019 to 6.3% of GDP in 2020 and 4% in 2021. For the Philippines, the fiscal deficit in 2020 is expected to widen by about 2% with two percentage points of GDP compared with pre-COVID times. However, the government's fiscal position remains sound with the debt to GDP ratio previously standing at 35%, which is low by international standards. Additionally, monetary policy can help sustain business operations in a targeted way and support the health and stability of the financial sector. Many Asia-Pacific countries have lowered the interest rates to provide liquidity for the economy. The Philippines has also lowered its interest rate by 125 basis points so far. In addition, the central bank has also injected liquidity through cutting the reserve requirement ratio, open market operations, and various regulatory relaxations. In addition to fiscal and monetary measures, it's equally important to enhance regional cooperation to combat COVID-19. Here, the region can consider coordinating debt relief or de deferral of debt repayments for those countries that lack the space to roll out large and targeted fiscal stimulus. And coordinating capital flows management to maintain foreign exchange market stability, such as by establishing bilateral currency swap lines. It is critical that when combating COVID-19, 
policymakers should not lose sight of our long-term vision for sustainable development. Business as usual is uh, cannot continue in the face of the long-standing climate emergency. If we continue with business as usual, it means that our economic growth will still heavily depend on resource use, which will continue to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions for at least the next three decades. Rising CO2 emissions in the next decades mean that we will fail to avoid a rise in temperature of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, because to achieve this goal, the world needs to reach net zero emissions by 2050, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So how do we achieve this? This will require collective actions by all stakeholders. As we call them, we, defer, we refer to local action, which is the responsibility of governments, people action, which is by businesses and consumers, and global action, which involves cross-border cooperation between countries. If we turn first to the local level, actions by the government are critical. They will need to embed sustainability in policymaking and decarbonize their economies. The first aspect of government action is to remove fossil fuel subsidies. Currently, in the region, such subsidies of $240 billion dwarf government investment in renewable energy of $150 billion. The removal of such subsidies would provide governments with a substantial source of funds for the needed annual investment to achieve affordable and clean energy. Our calculations show this amount to be $434 billion per year. For the Philippines, fossil fuel subsidies stood at 3.4% of government revenues in 2015. The next, next aspect of government action, building on the removal of subsidies, is to introduce carbon pricing. This can be either through a carbon tax or emissions trading scheme, ETS. The recommended range of carbon price to bring about a green transition is around $40 to $80. We can see that a carbon price of $35 a ton uh, on the left uh, would reduce carbon emissions by about 20% for the Philippines beyond business as usual by 2030. If the price were $70 a ton, the reduction would be closer to 30%. Furthermore, the government revenues that could be raised by a price of, on carbon are large. If you look at the right uh, graph, at a price of $35 per ton, the Philippines could raise about 0.5% of GDP by 2030. At a price of $70 per ton, it could, would, would be closer to 1% of GDP by 2030. Indeed, a carbon tax at the moment is not being implemented in the Philippines, and plans for doing so have been discontinued. There was a 2017 tax reform introduced uh, which introduced excise taxes on carbon-intensive products, such as petroleum, cars, and coal. If you converted those taxes into carbon taxes, carbon prices, this would lead to carbon prices between $1.6 for coal and $95 for gasoline. A third area of government action is supporting greening of financial systems. This will involve both financial incentives and regulatory incentives. Regulatory, uh, financial incentives involve, include special uh, specific lending terms for green projects, credit enhancements and government guarantees, and tax breaks. Regulatory incentives include supporting sustainability reporting, disclosures, and transition of businesses and financial enterprises through agreed uh, guidelines, supported, for example, by the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, which focuses on businesses, and the central banks and su supervisor networks on greening the financial system, NGFS, which focuses on the financial sector. However, in the latter case, the Philippines is still not a member of the NGFS. 
I will discuss issues such as disclosure requirements in more depth in the next section on uh, businesses. One specific area of government action in the financial sector is to encourage the issuance of green bonds. These have been growing fast in the region, increasing by 31% in 2019 to $173 billion. There have been a number of such issuances in the Philippines. The first green bond in the Philippines was issued by Abuites Power Corporation in 2016. The second bond in the Philippines was by BDO Unibank, who launched a $150 million green bond backed by the IFC. This bond has financed exclusively renewable energy generation, saving over 270,000 tons of CO2 per year. There have also been ESG bonds issued, which totaled $1.2 billion in 2019 and are expected to increase to $2 billion in 2020. The government has played its part by issuing green bond standards in line with ASEAN guidelines in 2018. If we now consider people action, firstly, by businesses. A key action businesses can take in the pursuit of sustainability is to ex internalize the external externalities of the business operations. One way to do this is to incorporate ESG considerations into their decision making. ESG standing for environmental, social and governance considerations. In the environment sphere, this means considering the business impact on water and pollution, resource depletion, and GHG emissions, among others. In the social sphere, this means considerations of areas such as employee relations, working conditions, and impact on local communities, among others. And in the area of governance, it means areas such as executive remuneration, corruption, and bribery, and political lobbying, among others. There are global principles for undertaking operations in line with ESG considerations through the principles for responsible investment supported by the United Nations. However, Asia Pacific businesses have not been very active in participating with only 15% of signatories from the region. Presently, the Philippines does not have any signatories. Another source of ESG guidelines comes from the Financial Stability Board-led Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD. This is a market-driven initiative set up to develop a set of recommendations for voluntary and consistent climate-related financial risk disclosures in mainstream filings. Again here, Asia-Pacific is less present, with only 9% of signatories. The first Philippines business signed up in February 2020. Another initiative that governments, that businesses can take to be more eco-friendly is to adopt internal carbon pricing to ensure that the true cost of their operations on the environment is reflected. About 35% of companies who, ex who have expressed the interest to adopt such a scheme are in Asia Pacific. Ayala Land is the first company in the Philippines to have declared such an intention. All of these measures, if undertaken and properly disclosed in a uniform way, will allow investors to make informed choices if they want to make eco-conscious investment decisions. If we now move to the next group of people action, consumers. Consumers need to move to more sustainable lifestyles. The key areas in which their lifestyles affect the environment and, and um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are in food, transportation, housing, and clothing. For example, in food, moving towards greater plant-based diets from animal-based diets. In transportation, less driving and air travel and more biking, ride sharing, and commuting on public transportation. In housing, more use of energy efficient appliances and reducing energy usage. And in clothing, reusing clothing and buying clothing not for one-time one, one use. 
The need for such sustainable lifestyles is especially apparent in urban settings, in areas such as transportation and housing. Metro Manila, for example, would greatly benefit from such actions, given its status as the most congested city in developing Asia. Governments can support consumers to move towards more sustainable purchases through nudging. Nudges by governments are positive reinforcements, small suggestions, or changes in choice architecture intended to influence the behavior of consumers. Nudging can and has been used, usefully employed in various sectors of consumption. One example is personal transport to reduce car use. Types of nudges which have been used globally include framing of information, inf information feedback on transport use and mobility patterns, changing the physical environment, and mobile apps that encourage walking. Another example of nudging is in energy consumption for residential housing. Some of the typical nudge interventions used include feedback on energy consumption, as you see in the figure here, prompts such as stickers reminding the building user to turn the lights off, and changes to the default option, such as when the environmentally friendly contract is offered as a default. Nudges currently in the region are not used very frequently, but there are some examples of countries. Singapore has been very active in using them, and other countries are showing increased interest, for example, India. The other way governments and businesses can help consumers to live a more sustainable life is by encouraging the sharing of idle or underutilized resources. Good examples globally of such services are ride sharing, such as Uber, and home sharing, such as Airbnb. Governments can encourage their use through regulatory and other actions to ensure fair pricing and safety. An example in the Philippines is the ride sharing company UN um, OWTO. And finally, the last uh, area of uh, action is global action through cross-border actions. One area of global action is on regional climate-related policies. This involves harmonization of climate-related standards across countries and cooperation on climate risk management. A second area of cross-border cooperation is actions to, to support decarbonization. One aspect is the development of regional carbon markets when establishing carbon pricing. This will be the most efficient way of reducing emissions by preventing leakage through actions by only some countries. Another aspect is scaling up trans-border po uh, power trade between countries rich in renewables and those dependent on fossil fuels, thereby making the regional energy mix greener. The third aspect of international cooperation is the implementation of the UN-supported 10-year framework on pro of programs on SCP. The aim of this framework is to introduce globally sustainable consumption and production methods with a view to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The work of the 10 FYF is carried out through specific thematic programs. Sound consumer information is a key milestone for sustainable consumer consumption and production. In this regard, the Philippines has made progress in implementing the 10 FYP, especially in the areas of eco-labeling of environmentally friendly goods. In terms of global action, the Philippines has made a strong commitment through its nationally, uh, national determined contributions as part of the Paris Agreement to reduce carbon emissions by 70% by 2030, as compared to business as usual. However, it remains the case that such a commitment is rated still at only the two degrees Celsius compatible level and not sufficient to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius Paris Agreement limit. If we move finally to then our recommendations for the Philippines in particular, well, the government has taken a rapid proactive approach in dealing with the immediate impacts of the pandemic. But going forward, as the country spends on recovery programs, 
there is a need to build back better. This will involve especially spending directed towards emergency health preparedness and greater so social protection for vulnerable groups, while also taking steps to continue to decarbonize the economy. The country has the fiscal means to bear the necessary expense due to its strong fiscal position and good macroeconomic management. And for our overall takeaways from our report, COVID-19 pandemic should be taken as a catalyst to change our development approach to one that prioritizes people and the planet. And this is even more necessary as the region is facing a climate emergency. And to do this, all stakeholders must act collectively at the local, people and global level. Governments should prioritize sustainability and decarbonize their economies. Businesses should internalize the externalities of their business conduct and consumers should be more mindful of their lifestyles. And finally, countries should enhance global and regional cooperation towards more ambitious solutions. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee, for your uh, thought-provoking and comprehensive presentation. I'm sure our participants have questions, but uh, please park them for now because we still have another presentation plus the um, uh, comments of our discussants. But please, if you have any questions now or any comment, please feel free to uh, use our chat box and we will entertain them. Your questions or comments during the open forum. Okay. So um, our second presentation is on the health sector, uh, particularly the experience of the Philippines in the devolution of health services and its outcomes. Um, if you will recall, uh, Dr. Banerjee's presentation um, emphasized the importance of prioritizing uh, the planet and, and the people. And uh, uh, in terms of prioritizing uh, people, this means making sure that the population has uh, access to adequate, to timely, and to quality um, health services. And as such, the right kinds of uh, the right kind of policies should be present. And our second uh, presenter will show us uh, if the health devolution policy in the Philippines has helped achieve that objective. And our next presenter is um, a supervising uh, research specialist at PIDS, where she has conducted studies on decentralization, health, education, social protection, child protection, government taxation and spending, water policy indicators, and the MDGs and SDGs. I think congratulations are congratulations are in order because she will soon be conferred the uh, uh, a PhD degree in public policy uh, from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. So, friends, here now is Miss Janet Janet Cuenca. Janet, over to you. Hello, Janet. Could you please test your mic? Uh, please make sure that it's uh, on. Hello, Janet. Okay, uh, we're still waiting for for Janet again, uh, for our Facebook uh, followers, um, we, you are welcome to join the discussion. Just uh, write your comment or your question in the discussion in the um, comment box, and we will uh, entertain your questions or comments during the open forum. Janet, are you are? Can we now hear from? Can we now listen to your presentation? Okay, um, we're having. Okay, uh, we still cannot. We don't know what happened to China. At this point, um, perhaps we can already. 
we can make some uh, uh, changes in a few changes in, in our program and perhaps we can now hear from our uh, discussant the discussant of the first uh, of the the first presentation and as soon as Janet when Janet is ready then uh, we will um, call her okay so we have invited um, an expert to share he, uh, her comments on the UNS Cup report. And um, our discussant for that report is uh, Dr. Uh, Marites uh, Tionko, who is a full professor and dean of the School of Economics at the De La Salle University, Manila. And Dr. Tionko's work uh, focuses on uh, human capital development, poverty and inequality, and, and, and on the economics of agricultural development. So I now give the floor to Dr. Marites Tionko. Dr. Tionko, please. Hi, good afternoon. Hello, okay. Magri rejoin ako. Test ba? Oh, there. I, I can hear Janet. Okay. Can um, you hear me now? Yes, Sorry. Janet. Just yes. yes, Janet. Uh, we can hear you. I have just yes. called uh, Doctor Tionko, so perhaps we can now proceed to the um, comment of Doctor Tionko. Then I will call you for your presentation. Okay. okay thank you. I think that is uh, also a logical uh, sequence because it uh, Doctor Tionko's uh, comment follows the presentation of Doctor uh, Doctor Shubuji. Steph, please. Right. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shar. And thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to react on the UNS CAP's Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific 2020 towards sustainable economies, uh, which was presented by Dr. Shubhajit Banerjee. So, uh, of course, thanks to PIDS for, inv for the invitation. Um, the presentation was very comprehensive. Uh, I, I, I need not really go through the several pages of the report of the survey, and it focuses mostly on the goal 12 of the sustainable development goals, which is ensuring sustainable <laughs> that is promoting resource and energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, providing access to basic services, and green and decent jobs. So what the survey proposed was a transition towards cleaner production and less material intensive lifestyles supported by enabling policies. Uh, the key messages were very clear, but there was something that is, of course, uh, disappointing, like Asia and the Pacific is not on track to achieve any SDGs, particularly the goal 12. And the main takeaway there was that all stakeholders must act collectively at local people and global levels. Governments should prioritize sustainability and decarbonize their economies. Businesses should internalize the externalities of their business conducts and consumers should be more mindful of their lifestyles. And countries should enhance global and regional cooperation towards more ambitious solutions. With the COVID pandemic, I think after this, the economic recovery and all, we have to rethink whether our goal really is to achieve economic growth or is it more on sustainability, a sustainable economic growth. Um, I recall the, in 2015, so uh, I'll just cite Laudato Si, the encyclical letter of the Holy Father Francis on care for our common home. It highlights the intimate relationship between the poor and the fragility of the planet. Protecting the planet requires an integrated approach combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. Now, this is really very tough. And Pope Francis even challenged us about the change that is going to happen. 
So the change is actually impossible without the motivation and the process of education. I guess that's the reason why I was invited here because I'm representing also the academe. And it's wonderful how education can bring about the changes in lifestyles. So the efforts that we have done so far are not are really contributing to the sustainability, especially the goal 12, which is consumption and production. We have done a lot, but I guess it's not really enough. Like we have the environmental responsibility that we encourage among our students. Even the local government have uh, those ordinances on avoiding the use of plastics and paperless, right? And then reducing water consumption, um, separating refuse, cooking only when you only what is reasonably the consumed, and then showing care for other living beings. Usually, public transports are carpooling. Now that it's COVID, with the COVID uh, containment, we don't go out. And more on, of course, there's also uh, regreening, which is the planting trees, turning off unnecessary lights, reusing something instead of immediately discarding it, and then and all other practices that we can do on our own from our homes. These efforts are similar to what the survey, uh, the UNSCAP has proposed, a transition towards cleaner production and less material intensive lifestyles supported by en enabling policies. So, indeed, the reshaping habits of behavior is not easy. My exposure to recycling and waste segregation was way back actually 40 years ago, so you know my age. So this was then during the daily lectures of my dad on how to make compost our, on how to make compost of our waste, how to recycle plastic bags, containers, because during that time, there, those plastic bags and plastic containers were non-biodegradable. And there has to be an enabling environment in place. So that's where the government comes in. Government regulations and standards to provide the overall policy framework to encourage a transition to a green economy. We're not lacking on that. In fact, in terms of plans, the Philippines is number one to that. So we have, like for example, the Climate Change Act way back in the early 2000s. And also in the academe. So we have already put up some uh, programs. For example, uh, in the case of Ateneo, there's uh, MS in Sustainability Management. We at the NSU, we have the PhD in Sustainability Science by Research. So initiatives have been accelerating in terms of environmental education for sustainable development within academic institutions. There has also been mainstreaming of collective and collaborative actions on environmental protection and preservation within the universities, within schools, and holistic systems approach, like learners are taught life cycles, supply chains, interconnected processes that influence lifestyle choices and environment. But the awareness and knowledge is different from putting it into action. I guess that's the problem of, of us, the people, and how we can really uh, contribute to the to us, to how we can really come up with, like, to act in a sustainable lifestyle manner. So there's also uh, the consumer demand where in now well, most of the consumers are aware of the like plant-based diets. So many are becoming vegetarian and consumers are mindful of food waste. So there's even campaigns for zero waste revolutions. So in the Philippines, there are local government initiatives, as I mentioned, and even the bamboo trees are, we, we are promoting that as part of our um, sustainable lifestyle. So we have the bamboo water tumblers, bamboo toothbrush uh, holders, and so on, bamboo tea bags, etc. For this COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown measures, we were prevented from traveling. So I guess that's also 
a contribution to decarbonization. And because of the three months lockdown, um, carbon emissions will probably have lowered down. And then there's a stop on the bans on air travels. So the skies are now blue, and the oceans are blue, no traffic jams. And in terms of uh, conscious consumption, so we have the eco labeling that was mentioned by Dr. Banerjee. And uh, this is actually an initiative from the business sector, from the suppliers of uh, air conditions, refrigerators, and so on. But that the, the research about that is not yet, um, well, in our case, for example, we haven't really finished the research on that on what would be, what's the effect on that on in terms of uh, sustainable consumption. There are actually a lot of things that has affect, that, that affected that was affected because, that were affected sorry because of the COVID nineteen crisis and mostly on food consumption value chains everywhere because of the containment measures the lost incomes perceptions of disease risk are also altering availability and consumer preferences so you cannot just eat out because you're afraid uh, that you might get or you might be contaminated. So during this pandemic, patients are with pre-existing non-communicable diseases and the elderly have a higher probability of contracting infection and the worst prognosis, including a higher fatality rate. So they have to stay at home. But people have to have they have to consume, right? And with the economic recovery, that's what we are trying to encourage more consumption to generate more income and so on. And uh, Dr. Banerjee also mentioned about the alternative economic sharing economy. And we have a lot of that already, Airbnb, Grabcar, Grabfood. Also the circular economy as a sustainable alternative for like the make use dispose. So it's not just yet the tradition. We still have that norm or tradition here in the Philippines. Uh, that, uh, you know, the hand-me-downs, it's not yet uh, a norm in some areas, but uh, in other, especially in, in the provinces, that's already becoming uh, popular. Uh, so, what else? There are actually, I think, 13 indicators of gold wealth, but I'm not going to be uh, mentioning all of them. I think I only have 10 minutes, and we still have the discussion uh, the Q and A. So I'll I'll just say that the most strike the the most important thing that we have done uh, is the implementation of the ten year framework, and uh, also the we have some reduction in the material in material footprints, and uh, men, the men, mention. Oh, Dr. Banerjee also mentioned about the green bonds, which is very important because uh, the Philippines, uh, more Philippine companies now are devoting the resources for environment-friendly and sustainable initiatives. And I think uh, the Philippines is dominant in, ter in Southeast Asia when it comes to the green and sustainability bond markets. What I think would be really uh, be supported and should be Push through is the adoption of carbon pricing. We were actually first on this in 1990s, but then I think because of lack of uh, support, especially on finance uh, funds, so uh, that we should set up again. We should set up the carbon markets, and by it, the decarbonizing of the economy would probably follow. So I agree with Dr. Banerjee on that we have to build back better, but economic recovery measures efforts should be sustainable, adding the potential of green job creation. Take note that to recover, especially here in the Philippines, economists still support the build, 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 uh, the infrastructures and all that. But we also have to take note that there's another B with the build, build, build which is borrow. So we have to borrow a lot now because we've spent a lot for the COVID-19. 
Uh, but that's okay because if we do also the infrastructure with green job creation, then probably it will be quicker recovery for all of us and also uh, strategy for resilience. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tionko, for those very important insights that you shared with us. Uh, if I may just hear a quick response from our uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Banerjee, before we proceed to the next uh, presentation. Dr. Banerjee? Hello, Dr. Banerjee? Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Thank you, so, thank you so much for that intervention. I mean, uh, quick response, so please. Yes, and well, there's really, I mean, it's it's been very supportive. Thank, um, we'd like to thank you for you know uh, your support for many of the measures that we've outlined. Um, uh, yes, indeed, uh, uh, as you were mentioning, COVID nineteen in a in an odd way has maybe kind of indicated the the path there that you know the path to sustainability because of some of the actions which have been forced on people during this time, but they have actually resulted in um, rather positive, at least environmental sort of impacts on the economy uh, indirectly, and which indicates perhaps a path going forward um, in terms of, you know, in terms of transport, in terms of um, material use. Um, again, as, as you say, um, uh, the problems, uh, uh, as we also tried to indicate in the report, is the first step is awareness for the consumer, but then that is the first step, but then you have to move to action, and uh, that's that's the difficult part, because say for the consumer, usually um, uh, uh, their habits are very ingrained, and so even with awareness, you, you sometimes need that final push to make uh, people change their habits, and that's where the government action comes in. Um, some sort of you know, as we mentioned, nudging or even you know, regulation in terms of uh, areas like the plastic bags uh, and uh, other elements like that. Um, again, as you mentioned, the Philippines has actually been rather, you know, forward-looking uh, compared to many countries in the region. So that's that's a very positive um, aspect. Um, you know, in terms of uh, pursuing the 10 FYP, um, being uh, dominant in green bonds. So that's these are all very positive aspects. But then, of course, as you say, um, there you know there are many things that remain to be done and. Uh, as one that we were also pointing out, carbon pricing pricing would really help, and any kind of moves eventually um, towards that would be very positive. Um, and then, as you say, as as mentioned by His Holiness as well, uh, there's this uh, close relationship between uh, social issues and the environment that they're interlinked. That that's that's a very crucial point that you pointed out. That's that's I think critical as we move forward. That the people and the planet work together, measures that are taken along you know, those lines, they're, they're really sort of uh, enforcing each other. That's these sort of synergies uh, between the SDGs as we, as we see them as well. So then, as you, well, as you pointed out, the big picture is that the government is the one who can play the key part in providing the en en enabling environment. So that's, that's where we really require, I suppose, from the viewpoint of voters and the, you know, the civil society, you know, the, the action to influence the government to take those measures. So thank you, I think, for the moment. I think that's, you know, that's how I'd respond and then we can move forward on the discussions. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee. We can um, discuss more during the open forum. But uh, right now, I think our second presenter is, is ready, as I mentioned before. Um, her presentation will be on uh, the health sector, particularly the experience of the Philippines in the devolution of health services and its outcomes. So I now give you uh, Ms. Janet Cuenca. Janet? Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the technical glitch earlier. My presentation is about fiscal decentralization and health service delivery, the Philippine case. Next, please. It is based on three PIDS discussion papers, which are chapters of my PhD thesis. Next, please. Next, please. For my research questions, first, 
what has been the experience of the Philippines in health devolution? What lessons and insights can be drawn from this experience, which may have implications for crafting future public policies in the country? Has health devolution improved service delivery in the Philippines? And has fiscal decentralization engendered efficiency in health sector and in health service delivery in the Philippines? Next, please. For the objectives of the study, I can see my slide there. First, to document the country's experience in health devolution and draw lessons and insights that are critical in assessing the country's decentralization policies and also in informing future policy making to propose an analytical framework that examines the effects of fiscal decentralization on health service delivery using the ID analysis, and lastly, to analyze the efficiency implications of fiscal decentralization using stochastic frontier analysis. Next, please. The next slide is about the outline of my presentation. I will not go over it. Of them. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. The enactment of the Local Government Code of 1991 changed the way basic government health services are delivered at the local level, from a highly centralized system of health service delivery to a devolved system, and that is to achieve efficiency and effectiveness of health service delivery by reallocating decision-making capability and resources to LGUs. Next slide, please. The next slide is an overview of the health devolution in the Philippines. Uh, it should be noted that health devolution meant the massive transfer of personal health facilities and budget that had an overwhelming effect on the health sector. Health devolution in the Philippines is considered as the most dynamic and complex scheme in the entire decentralization process. It is the most ambitious health decentralization initiative ever undertaken in Asia. That is according to a World Bank report in 1994. Next slide, Next, please. Sorry, I can't see that. So here, I, I just uh, defined what primarily health services are in RHUs and VHS, uh, which include health education, immunization against TB, polio measles, nutrition, treatment of common diseases. Next slide, please. The second one, I mean, the, second, the, the next slide is on secondary health services, which include medical services accessible in some RHUs, infirmaries, district hospitals, etc. Tertiary health services, medical and surgical diagnostics, treatment, and health and rehab care provided by medical specialists in hospital settings. It should be noted that DOH takes on the residual powers and functions, including oversight or general supervision of the health sector, monitoring and evaluation functions, formulation of standards and regulation, and provision of technical and other forms of assistance. Next slide, please. Here, I, I think I should highlight this that Section 17F of the Code states that the national government or the next higher level of local government unit may provide or augment the basic services and facilities assigned to a lower level of local government unit when such services or facilities are not made available or if made available are inadequate to meet the requirements of the inhabitants. Next slide. I go to the implications of health devolution, issues and challenges. Before health devolution, DOH recognized that many LGUs might 
be facing resource constraints. There was a policy dilemma then, whether or not to devolve health services to LGUs. But there's wisdom in doing it. That is the urgency of local action in providing health services without seeking top-level intervention. Next slide. However, the fact remained that many LGUs were not ready for devolution. Fiscal capacity of LGUs and managerial capability of LCEs, local chief executives, were not considered prior to devolution. No sufficient preparation to enable those affected by health devolution to cope with tremendous change it brought and strategic plan for introduction of health devolution was lacking. Next slide, please. Moreover, there are dangers associated with decentralization. Example, political capture within lower tiers of government, decentralizing corruption, and increasing inequality or disparity among others. I, I just want to cite some uh, um, existing literature here, or existing studies. Um, first, spending in health and education improves politicians' chances of winning. Re-election objectives of politicians can be aligned with health sector objective. Opportunistic political leaders employ some elements of decentralization for their own gain. Jurisdictions of political dynasties are characterized by lower standards of living, lower human development, and higher level of deprivation and inequality. There is evidence from the Philippines of the strong negative correlation between voter reports of receipt of private um, transfers, that is vote buying and provision of community health services. And lastly, politicization of health is a major concern raised by respondents in a study done by Liwanag in 2019, and politics is inevitable in health. Next slide, please. Next, please. Okay, okay. okay. Um, here I summarize the issues and challenges brought about health devolution into three broad topics. First is uh, financing for health. We all know that uh, this is a long-standing issue, the mismatch between era and cost of devolved functions, the cost of implementing Magna Carta for public health workers was not factored in coded estimation, and that put more strain on LGU's limited budget. On health personnel at the early stage of health, health devolution, there was resistance from devolved DOH personnel and LGUs, that is to absorb the cost of devolved staff. Also, geographic job displacement due to political differences between local chief executives and health personnel. Also, the issue on Magna Carta, which uh, has perverse impact on the relationship between LG Health Office and the rest of LGU personnel. Next slide, please. Organizational and structure change. There were issues on whether the local health boards and interlocal health zones are functional as well the issue on as well as the issue on fragmentation of health services. The admin of health facilities was transferred from provinces to different jurisdictions. And that resulted in disintegration of the chain of healthcare delivery system or separation of admin control between primary healthcare and secondary or tertiary healthcare. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons and insights that we can draw from, from the health devolution experience in the Philippines first? I would like to highlight this statement that I got from a DOH report. In retrospect, the present reality in the health sector is brought by several factors affecting the delivery of health services. One of these is the devolution of health services to the LGUs, passing on the big responsibility of healthcare to LGUs was done with novel intentions, but unfortunately with inadequate preparation resulting in inappropriate and ineffective health service implementation. So this highlights the importance of a well-planned and well-designed government policy to minimize, if not avert, unintended consequences. 
and I have to quote this uh, statement from the World Bank report, has the and unplanned decentralization, sometimes purely in response to political pressures, can create new problems. And this insight, I think, is deemed useful in crafting any public policy in the future. Next slide, please. A highly decentralized public delivery public delivery system brought about by devolution of health services is regarded as a structural weakness based on Solon and Herian study. The implementation of the various health reforms has been challenged by the decentralized environment, according to Romualdez. So one can't help but wonder whether health devolution was the right thing to do. But then Solon and Herian clarify that it is the way health devolution was implemented that fragmented public health service delivery and financing. This also concerns the design of health devolution. I, I should uh, highlight this uh, statement from Regni. The most appropriate level of decentralization in the health system is an, is an important unresolved political debate. So it's still unresolved. Next slide, please. Some LGUs are better able to reap the benefits of health devolution. There are success or success stories or good practices. The interesting questions to ask, why is this so? What are the factors that make health devolution work for these LGUs? Insights and lessons can be drawn from their experience and thus it would be useful to take a closer look at their experience and find out how good practices can be replicated in other LGUs with modifications to adapt to specific LGU context if necessary. Next slide, please. <laughs> now we, we go to the next study, the effects of health devolution and health service delivery. I employed the ID method to infer causal effect of degree or extent fiscal decentralization and health service delivery. So I have eight, eight, how much? Uh, 74, 74 observations times 12 years. Um, the observations are actually LGUs. About 1,491 municipalities, 143 cities, and 81 provinces consolidated at the province level in the period 2001 up to 2013, except for 2005 due to data and availability. I excluded ARM provinces because ARM follows a different organizational and governance structure as mandated in Republic Act 6734 of 1989. And I also excluded highly urbanized cities and independent component cities. Uh, on the other hand, the Nugget Islands was integrated with Surigao del Norte because it was part of the province until December 2006. Next slide, please. To ensure balanced panel data, the study employs two data sets, one with 54 provinces to examine the effect of fiscal decentralization on access to hospital inpatient services that is proxied by hospital bed capacity standardized to per 10,000 population and health facility-based delivery that is proportion of health facility-based deliveries or percentage of births attended in health facilities. The second data set is comprised of 37 provinces to examine the effect of fiscal decentralization on access to hospital inpatient services and access to safe water and sanitation. Next slide, please. The hypothesis of my study is this. Greater fiscal decentralization results in better health service delivery. Um, the baseline period that I used is 2001 to 2004, which is 10 years after the passage of the code, the change over phase and the start of transition phase of health evolution in 1994. The post-intervention period is after 2004, wherein LGUs are expected to have developed adequate capabilities, but POH incurred huge spending for health facilities enhancement program and deployment of health personnel to LGUs, both of which are devolved functions. Next 
slide, please. Next, please. For the purpose of the study, I measured the degree or extent of health devolution by using this ratio of local government health spending to general government health spending, where general government health spending is national government, that is DOH spending, plus LGU health spending. The concept of autonomy is explained in terms of Subnational expenditure expressed as a percentage of total expenditure. It is the fiscal impact exercised by local or lower governments as opposed to that exercised by the central government. According to Snyder, the most it is the most appropriate way to gauge fiscal decentralization because a larger proportion of expenditures, in this case health expenditure, is spent by lower level governments in that fiscal impact has shifted away from the central government. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the next slide present the control variables that I use for the study. I don't think I should. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, for, for the findings of this study, Health devolution has negative impact on level of access to hospital inpatient services. This is consistent with the narrative in literature and effect of health devolution on hospitals. There is lower province level spending on hospitals due to the mismatch between the cost of devolved hospitals and era. Such negative effect has remained over the years according to a DOH administrative order um, there was, uh, or there is a neglect of public hospitals and health facilities due to inadequate health budget. Next slide, please. LGUs failed to maintain and upgrade devolved health facilities. Um, other indicators of fiscal decentralization also have negative effect on the level of access to hospital inpatient services. It is counterintuitive as economic literature on fiscal federalism identifies improved service delivery as one of the potential benefits of fiscal decentralization. So, we go to the next study, please. The efficiency of local government health spending. The findings provide empirical evidences on the efficiency implications of health devolution. Health devolution, as measured by the HEDR, the, the one I presented earlier, has positive effect on the mean of the inefficiency distribution, thus adding unnecessary cost. Such findings are not as expected because one of the theoretical benefits of fiscal decentralization or health devolution is efficiency. However, findings of the study are consistent with the literature. Um, next slide, please. Issues on mismatch between local government fiscal capacity and devolved functions, fragmentation of health system, existence of two-track delivery system and unclear expenditure assignments inevitably create efficiency. So what are the policy uh, implications and recommendations that we can draw from, from these studies? The literature on fiscal federalism offers explanation as to why fiscal decentralization fails or succeeds in de delivering the expected gains. According to Guman and Singh, 
impact of decentralization on public services delivery should be accompanied with sound financial resource base of local governments, full autonomy to local governments in human resource management matters, regular capacity building of local officials, performance-based incentive structures, and participatory governance. Next slide, please. Sound financial resource base relates to LGU's capacity to generate revenues. Um, provinces have weak taxing power, but they have the immense responsibility of maintaining and operating provincial hospitals. Thus, there is a need to revisit and amend the taxing power of the provinces. Next slide, please. The era distribution formula has been criticized by, I mean, so many, and these criticisms were uh, cited in a Manassan study in 2007. First, vertical imbalances, lack of an equalizing feature in the formula, thus widening geographic disparities in human development outcomes and level of economic development. There is a need to address these issues that is to review and revise the era distribution formula, especially in the light of the Supreme Court ruling on era. If these issues are not addressed, the implementation of SC ruling on era starting 2022 will magnify or highlight even more the disparities in fiscal capacity and in turn human development outcomes. Next slide, please. The SC ruling on ERA is a positive development that ensures LGUs of increased fiscal transfers. However, LGUs must spend the ERA and other revenues judiciously and ensure cost-effectiveness of local, local programs that is getting more value, value for money, especially that it will be a huge challenge for the national government to augment whatever shortfall in government services at the local level due to budget constraints. Next slide, please. Huge amount of government funds will be transferred to LGUs in the form of unconditional block grants starting 2022. Local officials should be convinced to invest more on health. DOH will face the challenge of ensuring that LGU health spending is supportive of the national objectives for health, that is, better health outcomes, more responsive health system, and more equitable health care financing. DOH may want to consider expanding its health leadership and governance program to capacitate more local officials and also leverage the assets of the universal health care. Next slide, please. Under UHCA, the Universal Healthcare Act, integration of local health systems into province citywide health systems through a mechanism of cooperative undertaking among LCUs. It's an issue to ensure the effective and efficient delivery of health services. The integrated health system shall be linked to at least one apex or end referral hospital. In this regard, there is a need to address the deterioration in the access to hospital inpatient services. Also, the need to address the disparity in access to hospital inpatient services, which were sent in 2013 compared to earlier years. Next slide, please. A proportion of the proceeds from RA 11467, that is newly enacted sin tax law, can be used to improve hospitals and other health facilities as the law mandates that 20% of the revenues shall be allocated nationwide based on political and district subdivisions for medical assistance and health facilities enhancement program. The annual requirements for these programs shall be determined by DOH. It would be interesting to find out how the various syntax reforms benefited the LGUs, particularly in terms of improving health facilities, and also the geographical distribution of HF1 in 2014 onwards, as this has implications for addressing disparity 
in access to government health facilities. On issues on mismatch between local government health facility, sorry, next slide, please. Yeah, on issues on mismatch between local government fiscal capacity and default functions, fragmentation of health services, existence of food truck delivery system, and so on. These issues should also be addressed to fully reap efficiency gains from health devolution. It is critical to revisit or review the code section 17C and 17F, which encourage the existence of two truck delivery system, thus bringing about confusion and weak accountability between levels of government and in turn in efficiencies in health service delivery. And I think with that slide, I am done. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cuenca. So that, now let us hear um, the comments of our um, uh, second uh, discussant, uh, whom we invited to react on uh, the presentation of Ms. Cuenca on, on um, the outcomes of health devolution in the Philippines. So our um, discussant is a familiar face on Philippine television these days, so as she's part of the emergency response uh, for the COVID on the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, she is a special assistant to the Secretary of Health for universal health coverage at the Department of Health. And uh, most recently, she was designated as director of the Health Promotions Bureau. She has contributed to the passage of key legislations on uh, sugar, sweet and beverage tax, tobacco tax and universal health care, and the institutionalization of the health technology assessment process. She has also worked with uh, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation and has provided technical assistance to the government of the Philippines and the Great Mekong Subregion and Health Financing, Maternal and Child Health, and Health Impact Assessment. Friends, I now give you Dr. Beverly Ho. Dr. Ho, please. Hello, good afternoon, Po. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ma'am Janet, for your presentation. Um, I think it encapsulates a lot of what we would probably hear from people um, when they would talk about decentralization um, in various fora, no? And in a way, you very succinctly um, summarized what are issues um, as, as regards to the evolution of health services. Um, from our end, I guess um, I have a few points to make, you know. First, um, you're correct, like in most of our issuances, um, you would see um, the concept of devolution being quite um, reflective, no? But I guess in my short stint here in the DOH as well, um, there's also a realization that it's not so much also about the policy aspect, but also how mentally people within an organization process um, certain policies. No? Um, a lot of our colleagues here um, were present or were actually um, part of the health sector as early as the times when um, there was still no devolution. And at that time, there is, a, there is actually a, a concept that the health sector was doing far better than when it was devolved, right? And so if you talk about simply policy, yes, on paper, I would say there is, um, it is being recognized, but actually how does the, how do people actualize this, no? Um, and we know that, say, as simple as a program like Doctors of the Barrios, which is, um, which sprouted because of lack of, I mean, basically a failure, no? of um, certain parts of the decentralization process. Um, so you can look at it two ways, that it was successful because it's still running after 20 something years, right? But some people will also say, the main reason why it's still there is because the LGU still haven't um, sort of like embraced or have the capacity to make sure that they have sufficient health human resources. So that's probably a first, um, a first way of looking at um, on paper versus the political processes surrounding the implementation of certain um, 
certain policies um, as regards to health service devolution. Second would be the public narrative around, I guess, accountability for health per se. Um, you would, we all know for all of us working in public policy space that yes, it is devolved, health is devolved. But at the end of the day, if you would have outbreaks, if you would have um, certain issues, where where does the public focus back on the accountability, right? It is still basically in your national government agencies. And I say this with probably with a lot of caution as well. Um, but perhaps the whole point here is also that are the public sufficiently, um, I would say, educated or aware whom to exact accountability from? as it relates to health services, right? Um, if the services are um, are perfectly well, then the LGUs are really um, stellar, right? But if the services are not there, um, how is the national government agencies or its regional offices able to respond to such, um, to such problems? And how does the public look at them as um, as responders no, to these services. Um, the third point that I want to make um, is regard to primary care. Um, we have made several, you know, we have operationalized several parts of the health sector reform agenda, but perhaps um, something that is quite unique about the UHC law is the primacy of primary care. No? Um, and what we've learned from all these studies that have been mentioned is that, yes, there were reforms on pill health. Yes, there were reforms on um, hospitals, for example. But there wasn't a singular move for our country towards um, shifting the pyramid towards primary care. No? So we're still very much specialist-based healthcare services and the, the emphasis on hospitals. If you look at reports, we would have very good reports on hospital to population ratio, beds to population ratio. Still health is all about reimbursing hospitals correctly, but not really primary care. And I think this is the, the thread that binds what uh, Ma'am would call, Ma'am Jan would call like a two-track service delivery, um, two-track system. No? Um, we realize that the reason why primary care day in, day out, has been um, left out is largely because of how the governance structure is. You have municipal health systems, which are relatively underfunded, being asked to, um, being asked to take care of primary care, um, BHS, RHUs, etc. And then you have, um, and then you have your provinces, which are largely in charge of hospitals. Ganun yung hatian, di ba? And, and because of that, you're actually promoting fragmentation among the, 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 two, the two levels of government. No? And that's why the UHC law tried to sort of bring this together by saying we move towards an um, integrated province-wide or city-wide health system, hoping that um, the province with more power, more resources, will be able to sort of take responsibility also of the primary care services. And this would sort of like integrate your um, primary care-led um, integrated health system. Um, and maybe my, my last point will be related to, to how um, each institution view their functions. Over the last few years, there have been several attempts to streamline the role of the Department of Health. Um, and the UHC law sort of um, made, ha, had made that quite successful in a way that finally there's something on paper that says the DOH should gear towards um, doing mostly um, stewardship role and away from service delivery, right? Because financing is PhilHealth's role. Service delivery is LGU or the private sector's role. And the DOH has to limit itself towards regulations, stewardship, planning, national planning. Um, it is difficult to get to that because the, I guess the institutional talent 
is still let's deliver the service, right? So more than um, say Meda, for example, which is used to let's just plan and everyone else um, does the actual work, you know. So parang iba preny yung institutional psyche don. But I guess that's uh, that's first step um, in in getting the DOH also finally try to see what competencies should our organization really have, considering that we're not supposed to render um, frontline services, um, pr- probably except during, um, during times like this, during crisis. But it also still raises a question around um, when, until when will DOH continue to have a set of hospitals, diba? Because that's, that's still service delivery. And that's conflict in, in a way that um, when you do regulatory functions, for example, and you still own your own health facility, what does that imply, right? And it always gives um, the organization sort of like parang a dual perspective on where, where are we just regulating or are we also still providing services? Um, yon. So I guess those, those few um, points... Um, I'd like to just put it on the table as a supplement to the very great work that Ma'am Janet has already um, done in summarizing our ways moving forward with UHC law and um, you know, further clarifying what the role of the LGU is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ho. May we get a quick response from our speaker, Ms. Cuenca, Janet, please. Thank you, Dr. Beverly, for your for sharing your thoughts about my study. I agree on the points that you shared. Uh, on accountability for health, I think after devolution, uh, I am not sure whether the pu- public was really educated that uh, the responsibility of delivering health service is with the LGU already. But then um, we should also recognize that the, the fact that the public good nature of uh, public health um, requires DOH also to, to uh, provide uh, services in this regard. Right, Dr. Nicole? I mean, because public health is uh, public good, then DOH cannot really abdicate from uh, delivering some of these services. Quoting from Dr. Manasan. <laughs> actually, ma'am, I learned... oh, oh. So actually, based on the, the devolution, um, the, the entire public health services, like as it is provided no, as a service, it's all devolved, right? So the role yeah. of the national government is largely monitoring um, but, uh, and standard setting, no? But but yeah. I agree, I mean, that doesn't abdicate us from the functions. Yeah, but actually, um, the, the fact that public health was devolved is a big question to me because if you look at the literature on fiscal federalism, you don't actually devolve services that have... Um, spillover effects like public health so i don't know i don't know what's the reason behind it was involved but maybe it's sort of political or i don't know maybe maybe, maybe it's something it's a portion of the local government code that should also be revisited and yeah and about the the fragmentation of uh, health services. I think the UHCA has um, the, the, the concept of the province-wide, city-wide health systems, I think, sh- uh, should address fragmentation. But looking at the, in- the implementing regulations, rules and regulations of the UHC, I noticed that uh, it's actually not man- um, not required for LGUs, or the LGUs have the option to to um, not to integrate into province or citywide health systems. Is that, did I get it right, Dr. Bob? Yes, ma'am. So during the um, debates in the House, um, 
what was agreed with the lawmakers was that we actually didn't have sufficient evidence except for, I think, one UP Econ study that said um, it's better to integrate at the provincial level. No? But beyond that, we didn't have any solid evidence. And so the lawmakers were saying, um, why would we legislate something that has no solid evidence yet? No? Parang lahat sa atin, logical eh. That it was too devolved at the municipal level, so we go higher, um, not so much um, recentralization full to the national. So when they said you didn't have sufficient evidence, the parang the agreement was okay. We put something in the law that encourages this, that funds this part, and after six years, if there's actual review that happens that says okay, it worked for the integrated LGUs then there's an option to do an EO or actually even legislate the full um, recentralization to the provincial level. Pero yun din po yung naging dilemma namin. Wala talagang study. <laughs> Which your, your, your paper rightfully pointed out as well. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think we can now proceed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ho, and thank you, uh, Janet. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so I think we can now go to the uh, uh, open forum where uh, our participants can freely ask questions and, and give their comments. And looking at our chat box, we have a number of uh, questions from uh, Mr. Mr. Daniel, Mr. Dan Agustin of the Masag Masaganang Sakahan. Uh, Mr. Agustin, could you please ask uh, your questions first to uh, Dr. Banaji, and later we can entertain your questions for Ms. Cuenca. Mr. Agustin, are you still are are you still in the in the event? Hello, Mr. Agustin. Yeah, he's still around. Um, hello, Mr. Agustin, can you hear me? Could you please turn on your microphone? Okay, let me just read the first question of Mr. Dan Agustin, and this this is for uh, Dr. Banerjee. He said, excellent presentation on global action. What strategy should we adopt to convince President Trump and President Xi Jinping to join and participate actively in the Paris Agreement. Okay, and then another question for Dr. Banerjee. If we shift if we shift our lifestyles from animal based not to plant based, it might adversely affect our hog cattle, chicken raisers, including big farms that employ many workers like uh, McDonald's and Charlie I think uh, he wants your comment on, on, on this uh, shifting uh, lifestyles um, intervention, which is uh, part of, of your uh, presentation. Okay, can we now hear from you, Dr. Banerjee, on your uh, response to this uh, uh, two questions? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the questions, um, Daniel. Uh, well, I mean, well, very, very, uh, very deep questions, and um, um, yeah, difficult to give very, you know, very concrete answers to this. But what I'd say is that, well, definitely from the China side, China has shown, um, you know, the willingness to be involved in the Paris Agreement and, you know, move forward. Of course, there, are, you know, <clears throat> every country has, um, you know. Uh, difficulties in, in fulfilling, you know, all the requirements and, you know, the, the full requirements that are needed, that this runs across the board in our, in our, you know, in developing countries. So that's something to take account of. And, but I think, I mean, developing countries as a whole, I mean, what they're realizing is that climate change is not only a problem for the globe, but I think what's given them the, you know, the incentive to really um, take action on it is, them seeing the um, impacts within their countries themselves uh, in terms of because as we know climate change then has a you know impact on um, environmental problems within countries and that's what we're witnessing and i think that's what's given the incentive to many countries even for their self-interest in a sense to now move much um, faster on on taking action on climate change not only to help the world 
but to help themselves. So that's what I'd say. And that's probably the, the best way to convince countries. I mean, one is self-interest, and of course, one is concern for the globe. It should be a, um, ideally a combination of, you know, uh, of the two. Uh, and I think that's probably what you can say moving forward. I mean, this is a challenge for all countries in our region, and we have to persuade all of them to, you know, um, to look within themselves and see that we are feeling the impacts of climate change. So that's, you know, that's really it makes something, you know, imperative for us. Um, on his other question on um, on food, moving to an animal-based diet. Well, I, first of all, I think this uh, issue of a plant-based diet, uh, moving to a plant-based diet, that, you know, the plant-based diets have, a, or uh, animal-based diets have an incredibly um, a difficult impact on the poor. There are many ways in which they actually negatively impact the poor. You know, as we know, animal, ba uh, you know, Animal rearing uses up a huge amount of resources, of, of land, of food to feed the animals, and also water. Um, and so all of these aspects you know, really affect the poor. You know, within the Philippines, I would, uh, I would say, and, uh, you know, and um, across the developing world. Of course, there are certain categories of uh, people who, who may be the farmers themselves in that category um, who, are, who would be negatively affected. And so for that, you know, one, one has to consider, you know, um, measures to support them as, as in all social protection. Um, but, you know, especially this idea of the land being used up by animals, that really has an impact, in a sense, on malnutrition in, in countries for the poor. Because, you know, that means that that is land often which cannot be devoted to farming of a greater amount of food, which could then uh, feed the poor. So all in all, you know, the, Moving to a plant-based diet actually has very positive impacts, I think, on on the poorer segments of society. But of course, as I say again, I mean, it's you know, there's a transition, but it's also not the fact that it's even a government-led um, sort of move from plant, you know, animal-based to plant-based. It's a it's a global trend, and so you know, uh, even through the market mechanism, farmers will have to realize that you know there is this trend across the world, which will mean that they themselves will have to look for alternative, you know, um, alternative sources of farming, um, ideally. And often, in, as we see in the more developed world, uh, farmers, livestock farmers, have found ways of moving towards um, other crops, other high-value agricultural crops, often, uh, which have given them, you know, sufficient income. So, you know, I think this is a trend that we can see globally moving forward. So it's uh, something that we will have to deal with. But, of course, the government should provide, you know, necessary social protection and support and, you know, and training. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Um, Mr. Agustin's um, additional questions are for Dr. Uh, Dr. Chionko. Um, Mr. Agustin, are you now ready? Hello, sir. Okay, so let me just read um, his questions for Dr. Chionko. Um, for local action, what strategies we uh, can we take to decarbonize our economy? And then um, follow up follow up question related to that: What would be the effect of decarbonizing our economy on our mining and energy industries? Doc Dr. Chonko, are you still around? Yes, uh, I am here, Dr. Shar. So thank okay. you very much for uh, those questions. Uh, intriguing questions. <laughs> so um, I'll address the first one. At okay. The, at the local level, we're, we, yes. we are actually implementing some of them now, like using biomass energy, uh, renewable energy, like solar energy, and... Um, What's this? The geothermal. Yes, we're number one in this usage of geothermal energy. So these are rich natural resources that we find in most of the regions in our country. And also we can use energy efficient technology for production. Um, I mentioned earlier on the adoption of carbon pricing. If we have the prices right, in, in, in economics, if the prices are right, so there's demand and supply. So we can adopt the carbon pricing and 
probably remove fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, coal mining is still important in some parts of our country, but they are they are also improving on how they can lower the uh, the effect of of that on the externalities on the environment. So uh, these are essential measures that have to be complemented as well. Or yeah, maybe we can the government can give the right incentives because changing behavior, as I said earlier, is really difficult or and it's important as we transition or transform our economy into something sustainable. Government policies are also important. I mentioned earlier about some uh, ordinances, so that's at the local level. So it's not only national government policies that are essential, but also at the, at the local level. And we, it can start from, you know, building codes, fuel efficiency standards for transportation, eco-labeling, I mentioned that already, uh, use of uh, collective mobility like carpools and well the electrical power transportation is now becoming a trend uh, we have electric um, tricycles and uh, but again it takes political will to affect a change in behavior and attitudes and it's critical for making policy interventions and also to communicate that to our people. Uh, on the other question, it's very sensitive, but uh, I'll just say that I know that mining, we all know that mining is really extractive, but many Filipinos depend on mining. It's their life. Many depend on, uh, on it as their source of income as their main source of income and so perhaps uh, advocating responsible mining is important but before we do that we should look into the economic costs and benefits of mining large mining companies they can um, they can actually like follow the standards or they can comply but how about the small mining companies so we have to look into the direct and indirect effects of that of mining on the economy. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tionko. We have um, um, a few more questions from Dr. Agustin, but we'll go back to that. Uh, at this point, let us entertain the uh, um, a question from uh, Dr. Sutayut Osorn Prasop, a uh, senior Human Development Specialist, uh, Global Practice on Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, please Thank you proceed very with much. your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I have a question to, um, uh, to Ms. Janet. Uh, as as uh, Ms. Janet mentioned, that there are good practices of LGUs that delivered health services well. Um, uh, I'd like to hear... Uh, whether Jan, uh, Ms. Janet can share what are the key success factors for that, uh, what make them succeed, why the others uh, do not. Um, because we also hear that uh, from, the, from the discussion that uh, uh, a, a, a number, maybe the majority of the LGUs actually uh, um, do not uh, deliver the health services well under the current uh, model. And um, uh, so yeah, so I think that that would be my questions. And uh, on the uh, on the other side of the coin, it would be good for Miss Janet to share uh, also the, why um, most of the LGUs actually do not deliver them well. What are the key factors for that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutayud. Uh, Janet, please your response. Hello, Janet. Janet. It seemed we lost her again. Sorry. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> sorry, okay. sorry. Sorry for the uh, technical glitch again. So uh, the question by Dr. Yeah, uh, he's asking about the uh, factors that uh, help or enable the LGUs to succeed. 
in delivering the services. Uh, I think um, those factors can be summarized by by the factor. I mean, I mean the the slide that I showed earlier. The sound financial resource base of local governments and uh, full autonomy to local governments in health, in human resource management matters, uh, capacity. When, when we say capacity, it refers to technical and managerial capacity of local officials and uh, participatory governance. At least I think I, I saw these factors when I was browsing the uh, success stories, uh, mm -hmm. for example, in Galimpo. So, so the absence of these factors really uh, cause uh, LGUs not to be able to deliver the health services that uh, should be delivered. <clears throat> uh, thank you, thank you very much. Maybe if I if I can ask. Uh, uh, a probe a little bit deeper. I mean, these I would say I would see them as uh, maybe intermediate uh, factors. Mm, but but yeah. actually, what what enables them to be able to increase the capacity? Are they the rich LGUs to begin with, um, or you also see the examples of um, uh, poor that uh, poorly resourced yeah. LGUs that um, are able to provide uh, good health services as well? I mean, what are yeah. the underlying factors that, that actually help these LTUs to achieve what you mentioned? Thank you. Yeah, yeah actually, I think uh, one uh, driving factor is the political will of the local official to really support health uh, services. Um, the, the income of the LGU, I think, doesn't really uh, affect the the tendency of the local officials or local chief executive to uh, deliver services because I think there are LGUs who are poor, but I think their health services are okay, are good. If I remember it right, um, Pangasinan is one good example. It's a poor province, but I think its health service is good. So there, I actually didn't look at the good practices. I didn't include any... Um, specific studies on good practices in, in my paper. And the, the reason why I pointed it out in my presentation is something that I would like to do in the future. So if you want um, more specific examples of this, I can send you some, some examples of, of these uh, good practices. Thank you very much. It is, uh, it's going to be very useful. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Um, one of the um, authors mentioned by uh, Janet in her presentation is Dr. Rosario Manasan, a uh, former um, senior research specialist, senior uh, research fellow uh, at the IDS. And uh, Dr. Manasan would like to make a, an intervention regarding the presentation of Janet. Dr. Manasan, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Chat. Are you there? Dr. Manasan. Okay, we'll go back to Dr. Manasan, but at this point, let us um, entertain uh, the question of um, architect Amado de Jesus, vice, vice chairman of the Philippine Green Building Initiative. Architect uh, De Jesus, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes. Yes, please proceed, sir, with your question. Okay, um, this is addressed to Dr. Banerjee. A uh, very, very, uh, 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 the, the examples you brought up were very good, and of course, it's all towards the sustainable goal. I have just a few questions, which probably most listeners or the, the people attending can know already what it means, but. Can you tell me exactly what is meant by um, internal carbon pricing? Uh, some example of uh, internal carbon pricing, which I understand is already being implemented by by Ayala. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
in your slide. Okay. Okay, Dr. Banerjee, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Eternal carbon pricing is a uh, um, very uh, just uh, just a basic concept that um, companies themselves try to um, apply a price of carbon to you know, the carbon being used in their production processes. So apply you know a sort of true price of carbon, just as uh, governments uh, can do as well. So of course it's very variable, uh, depending you know on the amount of uh, you know price they'd like to apply but i think it's a it's just a realization by uh, companies that the world is changing and that uh, eventually you know either governments might Im impose this on them anyway and so they're sort of taking the you know the first step to do that and uh, be prepared for changing their production processes um that's that's basically uh, the concept that they're taking you know they're moving forward uh, faster than maybe even governments in the region are doing because they're looking to what's already happened in the West, how it's been imposed on them, and they want to be prepared beforehand for that. And we see a few examples in the region. Uh, Isla Land, uh, and as I saw from, you know, some, uh, you know, investigation. Uh, but there are others in the region. Uh, one we ca came across, which we sort of had a presentation from, and uh, we uh, learned more about, was the Indian automaker. Mahindra, which has been uh, quite active in in doing this as well, it's you know, had a very kind of comprehensive plan to uh, apply this across their business practices. And uh, yes, but uh, I mean, that's that's the concept. Oh, okay. Thank you. May I ask one more question from Dr. Banerjee? Yes, please go ahead, sir. Yes, please. Okay. Um, this has to do with your the PRI, the principles for responsible investment. This is also something new to me. Can you give us some examples of these uh, principles, Dr. Banerjee? Which I understand is uh, in the Asia Pacific, only 15% are uh, applying these principles. Dr. Banerjee? Hello, Dr. Banerjee? Sorry, thank you. Yes, I mean, uh, that's the larger point that uh, they uh, provide the guidelines for businesses to, you know, to undertake uh, responsible practices. The, I mean, and they run across the various uh, areas of environment, social and governance. Uh, I'd have to see the exact, you know, uh, various, uh, you know, the exact, uh, you know, the different uh, categories, except, but that's the, again, the larger concept is that, that you know, the UN supports this uh, voluntary kind of system for businesses to sign up for and, you know, by that indicate to the, you know, to investors and to the civil society that, uh, you know, that they've signed on to a global, sort of globally accepted, um, you know, a set of guidelines. And, um, but then, as you say, the problem is uh, uh, that Asia is still quite a laggard in this considering yeah, the number of yeah. large Asian companies which are involved. But again, uh, all the, you know, all the principles are set out in the internet and uh, you can uh, investigate them um, more deeply. But I'd have to go back and give you the exact details. Okay. okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much, um, Architect uh, De Jesus. Okay. Uh, Perhaps we can now hear the intervention of Dr. Manasan. Mam Chat, are you ready? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much, Sheila. I just want to make uh, a comment or clarification on the earlier discussion or exchange between um, Janet and Beverly Ho on uh, the devolution of public health and should public health be devolved. I, I think the what we have in the Philippines really is the delegation of public health in the sense that uh, DOH still continues to hold a big chunk of money for public health in the sense of uh, buying supplies, for instance, the vaccines for immunization, drugs and medicine for infectious diseases, uh, emergency response, and 
in some sense, public health has not been fully devolved. Yes, LGUs are in charge of delivery, but or implementation on the ground, which means, for instance, for um, immunization program, they actually give the vaccine shots to children and so on and so forth. But without the supplies, the vaccines and the medicines coming from national, they will not be able to do so. And, and in that sense, it's in that sense, I think that public health is not fully devolved in the Philippines and should not be fully devolved in that sense. Whether the OH will continue to actually buy the medicines and the supplies or in the future um, do some kind of cost-sharing arrangement with uh, the LGUs is another question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention, um, Dr. Manasan. At this point, um, allow me to uh, read some questions from our uh, Facebook viewers. And this one is from Ms. Pamela Diaz Manalo. Uh, and um, her, her question is for Dr. Banaji. The Dr. Banaji, the idea of our legislators in building back better, that is, um, she's talking about uh, for, uh, for the post COVID 19, is to create jobs instead of more dole outs, which can be difficult to sustain. What is the experience as regards to unemployment insurance, which can be a more institutionalized relief measure in relation to fiscal sustainability, especially of countries with high? with relatively high unemployment rates. Dr. Banaji. Thank you. Thank you for that interesting question. I think our overall advice, uh, which uh, I think I presented somewhat in the report, I mean somewhat in the presentation and which is also covered in the report, is this whole idea of social protection and uh, how, you know, how that has to be ramped up by governments, um, ideally in the short term, but uh, um, definitely in the long term. Because when a crisis like this hits, you know, it's, uh, it's very complicated to make sure that all, all people are, are reached, you know, all of those affected are reached. And the design of the programs is very important in terms of how you make sure that no one is left behind. And so, um, again, we talk about building back better. You know, as I mentioned in the presentation, one critical element is, is improving social protection. And within that, what we would argue is that we should uh, aim for a universal social protection model. And why is that? Because, you know, uh, with some of the measures which have been taken here in the Philippines and also by other countries, when they're targeted, uh, they leave out many people. They leave out, you know, sort of um, marginalized groups often, um, you know, informal workers, uh, street dwellers, uh, the disabled, um, many people who fall through the cracks. And that's why... I think we at the UN in general, you know, we, we would always propose a universal um, basic social income, um, social support model, at least, to make sure that no one uh, is left behind. So, yeah, that's uh. Thank you very much, Dr. Banaji. Okay, so we have um, additional questions from our Facebook viewers, and this time uh, these are for uh, uh, Ms. Cuenca. Um, okay, this is from Jeanette Estigoyurazo. Uh, she said this is, well, she's talking about the presentation of Janet. She said it's worth sharing. Healthcare professionals all over the world are standing up, speaking up, and showing up as global leaders slash decision makers. Reboot the complex systems on energy use, food resources, mode of transportation, among others. How about in the country? How strong is the voice of the public health sector? What's the likelihood that they are being heard? And uh, Dr. Ho can also comment, uh, can also provide uh, her response to these questions after Janet. Yeah. Janet, please. Uh, hi, I think I should defer the question to Dr. Ho because I don't think I'm in the right position to answer the question. Okay. I hope it's okay. Um, Dr. Ho, did you hear the the questions? Uh, may I please be clarified again with the question? Thank you. 
Okay. He, uh, she said, um, how she asked, how strong is the voice of the public health sector? What's the likelihood that they are being heard? Um, she most said recently. This, okay, please. I, go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead, Bob. Well, she, she asked these questions in the context of um, healthcare professionals all, all over the world standing up, speaking up, and showing up as global leaders or decision makers. Ma'am, most recently, um, so in the Philippines, we, um, we do have a public health group, but I agree it, has, it isn't as... As, as say as prominent as what you would see from the specialty societies, not the specialist, for example. Uh, most recently, there is a new um, society that was built, the Philippine Society for Public Health Physicians, for example, and they've been very active throughout this um, the course of the pandemic, um, developing uh, materials for LGUs to use, for example, because most of them are non-clinicians, no, so to speak. So I guess um, what we've also seen in the last few years is that um, going into public health, for example, has been actually a viable path for a lot of the young medical graduates who have um, considered exploring this like road less traveled, no, so to speak. Um, and so we're hoping that we get more people on board, not just to join DOH, but in general, to work in the public health sector because you have a you need to have a very different lens as well um, when you work in health policy or I guess public health specifically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ho. And um, another question from our Facebook viewer, uh, Mr. Antonio Avila, and this is uh, for uh, uh, Janet, for Miss uh, Janet Cuenca. Um, he asked, based on the lessons and insights derived from your study, what are the specific changes in the local government code of 1991 that you would recommend to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the delivery of health services? Wow. <laughs> it's a tough question. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, I think I, I suggest... Um, as I suggested in my slides, I think there's really a need to revisit the, um, the functions of the local governments as regards uh, the delivery of health service. Um, maybe you know, one uh, specific health service is the delivery of hospital services. <clears throat> um, I think... Um, I think the provinces are not really uh, that capable of delivering uh, hospital services because the because of the huge cost that is associated with the maintenance and operation of the hospital services. So I th think it's uh, there is wisdom in in uh, really Q and A. Yeah, there's a wisdom in, in revisiting the the devolved Hello? Yes, Janet, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. There's wisdom in um, re revisiting that uh, devolved service. Maybe um, it can be a shared responsibility between uh, national government and GU. I mean the province, but um, I think um, with the SE ruling on ERA, uh, there will be other considerations or, yeah. Hello? Hello. I, I think with the, with the SE ruling on ERA, I think the provinces will also have uh, additional resources, but the question is um, whether the province will really um, invest in hospital services, considering that the DOH right now is pouring money on the health facilities enhancement program. So I think it's one aspect that should be uh, revisited in the local government. Okay. Thank you for re your response, uh, Janet. Uh, we still have a few more questions in our chat box, all from 
Mr. Dan Agustin and all for Janet. Okay, Mr. Agustin, are you ready? Hello, sir. Mr. Agustin, would you like to ask uh, the question, the questions yourself? Hello. Okay, so let me just read his uh, questions. One is, he asked, she asked, he asked uh, with the increase of the sin taxes, will this help the financial issue of the devolution of the health system? And his other question is, do you, with the advent of the intern, how will dig digitalizing the devolved public system help? And, okay, those two questions first, Janet. Well, I uh, mm -hmm. I think the syntax, the proceeds from the syntax law will surely help because the law really mandates that 20% of the proceeds should uh, uh, be used for for medical assistance and HFEP. But the thing is, it's the DOH who decides on uh, on the distribution. I think of the of the, H, the of the proceeds. So right now, um, I'm interested in looking at the geographical distribution of the proceeds of that syntax law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As regards the digitalization, do you mean tele telemedicine? Tele is that is that what you mean, Dr. Agustin? Digitalizing the devolved uh, do you think okay, I don't quite telemedicine, I don't know. Yes, I it's it's something. oh perhaps we can uh, if if we can here directly from uh, uh, Mr. Agustin. However, uh, it seems that uh, he is unavailable right now. But uh, let's let's jump to the next question, which is: Do you think it is high time we incorporate the health practices of the indigenous peoples from our mountains who have their way of medical practice? Yeah. And uh, you can answer this, and yeah. uh, Doctor Ol. Dr. Ho can also uh, give her feedback. Well, uh, as far as I know, I think the local health uh, officials, the BHWs, really consider the, the, the beliefs of the IPs. It's the mm -hmm. reason why the target for the EPI was not set to 100% to, you know, give, I mean, because, because we know that... Uh, these IPs uh, do not like immunization, so I think in that sense, the local health officials or even the, the DOH recognizes the, the beliefs of the IPs. So it's already integrated. And, and we all know that the tra traditional HELOT are also integrated in the, in the health system. Mm -hmm. They are being trained to really assist in birth delivery. So I guess um, Dr. Augustine's uh, questions I mean, I mean, are already addressed in the current setup. The okay. Current setup. Um, Dr. Ho, would you like to make, to, to give your comments on this question? Okay. Um, just very briefly, um, yes. the DOH does, um, does help plan where the syntax goes but at the end of the day it's our lawmakers who decide where it goes no so we do have a plan and the st staff work is done whether there are there's an available lot for the particular area um you know everything whether that area is ready to receive that subsidy you know but at the end of the day we go through a legislative process and um, our lawmakers help um, decide where it really goes. And that's for 20% of the syntax. Most of it goes for goes into the cell health. No? So that's mm -hmm. one. Um, second, if I would um, respond to the digitalizing the devolve um, setup, what we've seen now in the COVID response is um, it will help us immensely in monitoring um, performance no, of certain LGUs, the number of cases, etc. If we have digital systems in place, that's a back-end system. No? Um, but to what, what, to what extent, uh, Dr. Bev, has uh, digitalization of, let's say, hospital records, to what extent has this been uh, implemented at the local level? Would you give us some uh, like figures or So at some... least for PhilHealth, 
um, they do have around, I think, more than 75% of facilities submitting electronically, no? But that doesn't mean that they are fully electronic, meaning they encode everything. So most of the facilities encode for purposes of claims, diba? Right? What we mm-hmm. want to happen in the future is that they see the value of digitizing for their own sake, not for the sake of submission. Yes. Lang. What we have done for COVID recently, we started with just um, aggregates. No? So the hospital submitting, um, they just key in the number of ICU beds that are still available, the number of PPEs mm-hmm. they have. Siyempre, it has its limitations, right? Um, is there a way to verify it? No, because you don't have a line list, right? And the mm-hmm. same way that's happening for the cases. In the beginning, in the labs, we were just receiving total. The total number of positives, the total number of negative tests. And recently, because of information system, we're able to get the entire list. And that's where we will be able to verify whether it's really 50 tests that they did or among the 50 positives they got. Um, that's only 45 because five are, you know, same name or duplicate. Um, and then we also use this opportunity to jumpstart what has always been there. People have been talking about telemedicine for a long time, but we haven't really done it, diba? Right? Um, but because of COVID, what people usually give an excuse na, oh, it's difficult to do it because Filipinos want to be touched by the doctor to, to, to talk to the the healthcare professional in person, that's that's actually gone now, right? Because you really can't go to the facility. And so we've partnered with a lot of telemed providers over the course of the last three months, um, some of them really giving free services. And the, the parang legal backing of this process in the past has been such a long debate, accountability, etc. But now um, it's out there, you know? We, 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 we issued a joint... Um, AO with National Privacy Commission on this. Lastly, on Indigenous peoples, um, I would say that there is, there has been a very strong um, effort naman to, to integrate everyone's beliefs no, into the system. However, there are things that we still need to do. No? So instead of um, not getting them vaccinated, for example, or not applying the facility-based delivery um, principle for our indigenous people. But I think the the strategy is also like sh- help shift the demand, right? So it means, so for, for vaccinations, for example, our um, healthcare professionals talk to the local leaders to help. So it's the local leaders now that explain to the indigenous peoples that this is actually needed, diba? So it's bridging them. And for example, for um, facility-based delivery, what has been done is there are many innovations on the ground wherein, say, the midwives would bring along the traditional birth attendants. So they're all included during the delivery process, diba? Right? Um, and then some traditional birth attendants actually even get some part of the PhilHealth reimbursements as well. So parang, um, instead of like having, like setting two different health standards for um the non-indigenous and indigenous people, I think what we're trying to do is to bring in, bring them into the fold, but clearly understanding that um, they might need their own leaders to also convince them of these practices. Thank you. Sheila, you're on mute po. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Bev. No? So I said we have um, another question and would appreciate your comment on this, your response on this. Uh, it's from also from um, Ms., uh, Mr. Agustin. He asked, uh, what strategies should be adopted so our top-notch medical doctors and nurses will practice in the countryside rather than go to London or New York. So probably you could comment on our programs like the uh, Doctor to the Barrios, etc. Go ahead. I think, sir, at this point, there is like um, a clear um, recognition that what we have 
um, done for a long time um, may not be sustainable. No? So to expect um, professionals to stay in an area where they, they have no roots, no connection for a long period of time might not be the most sustainable. And how other countries, ASEAN countries in particular, have done it is either they mandate a certain number of years of um, service in these rural areas, um, but for a limited period of time, recognizing that after that, you just get you just make sure that there's a, a flow of people that go into these areas. So rather than thinking that, okay, if I deploy this person, they will just stay there for the rest of their lives, no? So parang that, that sort of shift in, in thinking um, and strategy. So meaning we do need to get more um, structured programs in place for regular deployment. And then after that, in a way, subject to market forces already compared to our like parang former, ano na, they will continue to stay in that area. I think just being able to recognize that limitation um, sort of like changes where our future direction or long-term strategy will be. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Ho. Okay, and the last question from the same person, from Mr. Agustin. Um, which is better, should the devolved public health system be under the OH or under the DILG? Any uh, reaction, any, con any response to <laughs> this question, uh, Bev? Um, I guess what we have seen from our good relationship now with the ILG is that they can really enforce um, protocols among the LGUs and the LGUs really um, look to their policies as an order rather than a, I guess, a suggestion or a recommendation, right? Um, and oftentimes, I guess it's also like how the DOH, um, the DOH stance is. Other than regulatory policy, um, everything that we put out are standards, right? But because of limited ability to monitor and enforce, I think that's also, parang, that's also where we, we, we lack, no? To a certain extent. Um, I don't know. Probably, like, at, at this point, all I can say is that um, if we need the LGUs to do certain things, um, the DILG is really the strongest partner that you can have to, to enforce um, certain things. Yun po. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ho. Okay, we have uh, a follow-up question from um, our Facebook uh, viewer, Ms. Pamela Diaz-Manalo. And this time, this is for the UNS Cup, uh, Dr. Banaji. Okay, she asked, uh, would a universal social protection program be more efficient if the beneficiaries were individuals rather than families? I think the case of left out beneficiaries is a result of having both individuals and families as beneficiaries across different social amelioration programs. Dr. Banaji? Again, I'm not a um, complete expert on universal social protection, but I, I would assume that individuals have to be the first port of call because uh, obviously some are not in families, some are left out. And um, so, you know, there, there are various forms of uh, social protection, some which are, which are for families, some which are for children, which are for older people. But in the end, um, it is the individual who matters because often individuals are not in families. So, yes. Okay, thank you for that comment, uh, for that uh, response, uh, Dr. Banerjee. Okay, we have um, another question from uh, Mr. Um, Amado. From Antonio Avila. Are you, are you referring to me? Uh, yes, sir. I am, I am yeah. referring... To you, so, sir. Uh, okay. Yes. Do your question, please, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, just as, uh, as a backgrounder, I have been part of the technical working group of DOH in developing guidelines for green healthcare facilities. So my question has to 
is coming from a designer's point of view. Okay, the idea of uh, the health evolution, I think, is a great idea. It's in the right direction. Because um, why? The green healthcare facilities, I think, is needed in our country yesterday. <laughs> in our communities, if you have this uh, infrastructure all over the place, it will take care of the primary health care, as Dr. Beverly Ho mentioned. And this is to prevent the old habits of many Filipinos of going to the hospital when they're already very, very sick. If these facilities, which is a trend abroad, is spread all over the country and they are designed as green healthcare facilities, it will be convenient for people to go and have them checked for just the basic blood pressure, just the basic things, instead of getting already very sick, as I mentioned. We need green healthcare facilities. And it was not mentioned in the presentation of uh, uh, Ms. Cuenca. Maybe it was there in very small uh, items. But my question has to do with uh, why not tap the resources, the expertise of green consultants so that you have facilities. There was a question about uh, losing our practitioners to London and New York. If you build green healthcare facilities, that are very, very efficiently designed and properly designed, which is comfortable for patients and practitioners, they probably will, you will probably retain these practitioners, even if they're in the mountains, up north, down south, green facilities, I think would be a good, a good uh, way to get this project started. The devolution, there was no mention of this, of course, you have to take care of those financial problems and the IRA and uh, all of those budgeting but green facilities, which I have not seen, at least make one model for cities, one model for rural areas, then people will say, hey, this is the way to go. This is not, the, not just putting a, they, they look alike, they look like old small school rooms, classrooms. They're not, it, it can be, but do they function well? This has to be given emphasis. You're talking about healthcare facilities. By the way, green buildings are healthy buildings to start mm -hmm. with. So DOH should be the first one to get this thing started. That's all. And my request is maybe Ms. Cuenca can include this, their studies, incorporate green facilities instead of all those. Of course, you're talking about budget. Eventually, when the dust settles, you will want to know what do we build? This is something, and it's basic, primary health care. You feel a little dizzy. You don't go travel 30 minutes or an hour to go to Makati or to Quezon City. It's just there, walking distance. You go to your community. That's the whole idea of them spreading out small, simple, healthcare primary facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very um, thought-provoking insight shared shared with us by uh, um, architect uh, De Jesus on uh, on um, um, having a. Uh, Environment-friendly um, health uh, health facilities, and perhaps we can get the comment of um, our expert from the OH on this, Dr. Ho. Has there been a move? Uh, has there been some initiative from the DOH along these lines? I think precisely the project that Sir Amado has been in is to incorporate the green guidelines, no. Um, and I, I also am aware that the current revision of the Philippine Health Facility Development Plan includes some of these features. Um, so now the, the guidelines of the DOH as regard to the standards for health facility should have incorporated most of these. And I think we should also take, um, take the, the current moves to to make the environment better because of COVID, etc., cetera, um, we should use really this as, a, as an opportunity or an opening to push for this um, green advocacy further. No? Um, so yan lang po. I think some of it has already been adopted and um, more are underway. So we also encourage yung activists po natin, mga civil society organization to constantly um, keep this also in the, I guess, in the minds of the decision makers as well. So we get more support for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bev. Um, we have a 
Um, another question for you, and this time it's again from uh, Mr. Dan Agustin. He asked, what health statistics should also be gathered by the PSA to help the OH and the ILG in their mandates? So I, I guess at this point, the PSA usually collects um, both um, survey data and some of the mm -hmm. vital statistics data for us. So mga deaths, um, so the different causes of deaths. No? Um, we are very appreciative already of these efforts. I guess more than collecting new data, the challenge is actually in terms of analysis. No? Analysis of these data at the different levels. Um, how to make sense of both statist vital statistics data and maybe surveillance data coming from us um, and making sure that they come in timely for the decision makers to decide on. Because oftentimes they, they just come in as reports and, and honestly, um, the question always remains as to how much they're actually used in deciding priorities, for example, of budgets of LGUs in terms of high disease burden, um, highest disease burden in their areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Ho. Okay, let me just check if we have um, other, uh, well, Mr. Um, Agustin is typing. Okay. Uh-huh. We, we have no more questions left at this point. So, okay, so, okay, here's a final question to our, uh, huh. Okay, and this is um, for our, for Dr. Banerjee. Um, he asked, uh, um, her request is please include doable strategies to enable governments to implement, I think is referring to the, um, the, 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 um, the policy actions that are in your presentation, which I think some of them you have already covered, uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee, if you can make a short comment on this. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the question again. I'm not sure maybe this is even a, um, a suggestion to us in our future work that really we should, you know, uh, always give operational sort of suggestions to governments, you know. So that's that's a very very important suggestion. Clearly, um, that's what we you know um, aim to do. Uh, again, I would reiterate, as you were pointing out, uh, some of the um, uh, points I'd mentioned before from governments in terms of SCP and uh, most uh, directly in terms of uh, decarbonization. Um, uh, it was as as mentioned by the other speakers as well, uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, carbon pricing, um, you know, greening the financial sector, uh, and, and then, of course, their actions in terms of persuading businesses and consumers to also take uh, actions which are, um, you know, uh, more sustainable. So, you know, that's uh, the government plays a clear enabling role. It plays a direct role and an enabling role with all the other stakeholders as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you for that. And as our final question, we have, uh, may we hear from, again, from architect Amado de Jesus, sir? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, this is just on a lighter note. I noticed uh, Dr. Banerjee in your presentation, you included the word nudging. This is uh, defined by the dictionary I think as uh, to push lightly, to prod lightly. Um, this is in relation to just a comment on the situation here in, in the Philippines. We, there's always a low level of awareness when you talk about all of these things, sustainable development and all. And I think we need to have more, of the, more than a gentle push. We need to be prodded more strongly than what you say. Uh, I understand that uh, you said that this, they're doing this in Singapore and in India. In, in Japan, I think they're doing this nudging a little stronger. They use, they have a blacklist specifically for buildings that are not energy efficient. And uh, to the Japanese, this is something very bad because they don't like to be shamed. They don't like to be uh, in that notebook that shows. So, 
um, the, uh, the question is, how else can we do, you, you see, this is a very, very gentle push. What else are the other ways that you think we can be prodded to take action on all of these presentations you've done? It's all very nice, but it, it us, I'm so scared that this will all end up in paper again and nothing being done. What are the more, uh, you know, I see somebody nodding, probably agreeing with what I'm saying, but because it's really very hard to convince a lot of people and they don't even believe in experts. So they seem to know everything there is to know. So can you give us stronger actions on, on getting people to move in this direction? Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a very, very good point. I think I think we just um, uh, highlighted this as a sort of innovative method, which is still not very prevalent in the region. And so, you know, that's something. That, and because, of course, uh, as you were mentioning, that it has the advantages of sort of still um, leaving the final decision in the hands of either the business or the consumer. But, of course, clearly, there's all uh, there are many other methods which are more uh, prescriptive, which have already been used by governments in the region and are being used, um, which may, I mean, which were somewhat maybe um, uh, pointed out subtly in the um, presentation, but uh, are also in the report, which are, you know, uh, measures such as regulatory policies, um, tax policies, subsidies, I mean, um, you know, sort of outright bans, clearly, um, you know, so yeah, those are some of the much stronger methods. And in some cases they apply, but in some cases, you know, they they may, you know, uh, for certain actions perhaps prove too strong. And then, of course, you know, considering the country context, exactly as you were mentioning, in some country contexts, um, this is possible, whereas in others, um, you know, more, um, you know, sort of persuasive measure, measures. But I think what we would say, of course, in the end, is it's a combination of all the all the types of actions. You know, one is sort of regulatory actions. One is market-based uh, mechanisms through tax and subsidies. You know, uh, uh, to encourage uh, sustainable actions, and then finally through more behavioral uh, policies, as was nudging. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned Singapore. Well, Singapore, everybody knows it's a fine city, so everybody has to follow. <laughs> so, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, uh, what a lively discussion discussion we just had. And at this point, please join me in thanking our speakers, Dr. Shubhajit Banerjee and Ms. Janet Quick, and our discussants, Dr. Marites Tionko and Dr. Beverly Ho, for their um, thought-provoking, for their comprehensive presentations and comments. Let's give them a big virtual clap. Okay, and thank you to all of you for your active participation. Okay, so at this point, uh, just to, to wrap up, and uh, let me just borrow one very important takeaway message from the UNESCO presentation, that is that the current economic slowdown should, uh, due to the pandemic should not deter policy actions to facilitate transition toward more sustainable production and consumption. And as mentioned by Dr. Banerjee, uh, the pandemic can become a catalyst to change our approach towards pr prioritizing, prioritizing people in the planet. And that uh, prioritizing people, of course, includes improving the entire health delivery care system, the people, the institutions, and the resources to meet the health needs of the population. And our speaker, Ms. Janet Quenk, has pointed out the gaps in health resources delivery in the Philippines owing to our uh, resources and capacity constraints at the local level, which has resulted in uh, widely varying standards of health healthcare nationally. Nevertheless, as she pointed out, uh, some windows of opportunities presented by several legislations to improve our healthcare system, such as the universal healthcare law, and for financing purposes, uh, the recent Supreme Court ruling on the internal revenue allotment, which will uh, provide additional revenues for our local governments. Um, Another key message emphasized by our speakers as well as by our discussants and participants is that uh, promoting sustainable economies and better public health require the cooperation of everyone. It requires the collective action of all stakeholders. It requires cross-border cooperation. It requires the partnership and collaboration of governments at all levels of our businesses, the civil society, the academia, and of course, our local communities, us. And each one plays an important role. So with that, I'd like to now call our uh, president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her final remarks. Mamsel, please. 
thank you to uh, Sheena. I think this is one of our more uh, animated uh, webinars. And, um, and I think uh, there was one question, what would nudge us to action? I think um, if we remember that um, we committed to achieving the SDGs by 2030, and 2030 is just 10 years away, I think that would prompt everybody to action. And um, I, I think one of the takeaways uh, for me is that um, we need to be more innovative in responding to new challenges, um, like the COVID pandemic could be a catalyst. And when we respond to these new challenges, um, we need to take into account not just the immediate objectives, but the long-term goals such as sustainable development. So with that, I'd really like to, uh, we really appreciate the, uh, our resource persons today uh, from Bangkok, Dr. Banerjee, and uh, of course, our very own um, Dr. Janet Cuenca, and of course, Dr. Beverly uh, from DOH, and um, Dr. Marites Yonko from the LSU. So we're looking forward to having all of you in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamsel. And before we close, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the different institutions, different offices, who uh, that participated in our webinar today, uh, representatives from the Commission on Population, Department of Agriculture, Department of Budget and Management, um, Department of the Interior and Local Government, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the uh, Congressional Planning and Budget Research Department of the House of Representatives, the National Economic and Development Authority, the National Economic and Development Authority Region 5, Senate Economic Planning Office, um, the Office of Senator Villar, uh, the business, Philippine Business for the Environment, the Philippine Green Building Initiative, the Philippine Social Science Council, um, United Nations Development Program, of course, our partners from UNSCOP, uh, uh, USAID Office of Health, uh, World Bank, our colleagues at the PIDS, and the... Uh, Okay, and of course, um, our those from the academe, uh, like the De La Salle University. Okay, so just a few uh, reminders. Uh, you can access the PowerPoint presentation uh, from this. Uh, the power the presentations um, made at this uh, webinar. We can access them from the PIDS website. The, uh, the link is on your screen, but don't worry if you didn't catch that, we will email the link. Uh, secondly, uh, please answer the feedback survey that we will email you after this webinar. Your comments are important to us to improve our webinars. We will also send you the link to the, uh, the feedback uh, survey. And lastly, please, uh, do, please do not forget to follow us on our social media pages. We have a we have a, a website where you can download all our publications and you can see all our events. We have also, we also have a Facebook, of course. Thank you to our Facebook viewers. And also we have a Twitter account. So uh, friends, this ends our web, uh, webinar for this week. We hope to see you again next uh, Thursday. Our topic for next week is on the Philippine statistical system. So stay safe and stay healthy. on behalf of UNS CAP, thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, and this was really a constructive and productive and uh, really a deep discussion into the issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Yoti, Dr. Yoti Bisbay, for, um, for um, partnering with us in this uh, virtual event. And uh, again, well, this is an annual, already an annual thing for P uh, PIDS and UNS CAP. So yeah, we look forward to more, to uh, uh more webinars or okay face to face is okay as well thank you and um thank you bye-bye see you again all right bye-bye thank, thank you, you. Stay safe.